Good evening. And of course, good evening. Um, oh, there we go. So thank you for uh, logging in uh, to join us tonight, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, we are going to be, um, so last time, <laughs> oh, first, first, we have our, our, our study brought to us tonight by Christine's, flip it to the, yeah, there we go, Christine's S'mores Brownies, nice and warm and gooey and, and delicious, and oh, you went off already, you were supposed to keep it up so I can take a bite, it's okay, never mind. <laughs> Yeah, oh, it's delicious. All right, so last week we got through a whole six verses. Go us. We're in chapter 20, and so most of the discussion was the millennium and all that. All that. So um, we're not really going to get back into that unless we have any lingering questions about it. But we're going to, um, let's see. Let me see here. Oh, okay. So, um, Christine, if you would pull up, I think, maybe the last screen of the uh, reading, the first bunch of readings, uh, maybe verse 6. Let's see what we got here. All right. So, verses um, 5 and 6 here at the end of 20. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Uh, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. All right, so we talked about the thousand years a little bit um, and how we understand that. But and I think we closed quickly on this, <laughs> but we didn't really get into it too much. So we, we talk about the, the first resurrection, right? Talks about the first resurrection, which indicates that there's a second <laughs> resurrection. And then it talks about the second death, right? Which would lead to us to assume then that there's a first death. All right. So, um, so we're talking about the... Um, the, the dead who came to life after a thousand years were ended, uh, the first resurrection, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. So in this, we're talking about the ones who have come alive in the millennium. Um, so the first resurrection happens in this thousand years, which we understand to be life. <laughs> Sometimes life feels like it's a thousand years. Um, so this is the period from the ascension, to the last day, thousand years. So, these who have come to life in this time, this is the first resurrection. And to it's it's very easily understood in that what has Paul said? We are in our trespasses. We are dead in our trespasses. Dead in our sinfulness. We are spiritually dead. <clears throat> So, when we are living in this and we are brought, how are we brought to life? Through baptism. There's a font holding the water. <laughs> I don't know how the water is going to, that's, that was really weird. Oh, I thought that was our bells going off in the tower. So, here's the baptismal font. There we go. That's better. Baptismal font. No problem. So the, we come to life in the first resurrection. That is baptism, faith. Um, and so then the second resurrection would be on the last day, the resurrection that Jesus keeps pointing us to and talks about. Um, cool. So the second death, and we're going to get a little bit into that, um, I think, in the coming readings because we're, we're going to talk about the second death. But... Um, the second death, what we're going to see, so these are spared from the second death. Well, if the second resurrection is on the last day, well, the second death is also on the last day. So if, if you are part of the ones who are in the second resurrection on the last day, so you're brought to life to live forever in paradise with God, well, you are spared from this, but all those who don't believe go into this, so this would be 
eternal uh, condemnation, damnation, whatever, the lake of fire, hell, all these. So if this second death is this eternal death, then what might be the first death? Temporal death? Yeah. Um, you know, certainly we, we do die, <laughs> right? In this life, we die. And we join the saints in heaven waiting for the last day, the second resurrection. Hey, all right. We've got s'mores brownies. <clears throat> and they're, they're gooey and amazing. So that's the first resurrection, second resurrection, first death, second death. Not very complicated, um, very, very easy to, uh, to reconcile here. Um, any questions about that? I mean, that's pretty easy to track with. That is, that is all basically so, you know, anybody who dies... You know, and they, their soul goes to heaven and waits with God. That is, that is happening. So, I mean, this is all part of happening in this span. Um, correct. Okay. Correct. So it's just that the rapture can then be understood as a separate event. That right, right. And, and we'll, we'll actually... With what we'll talk about a little bit, um, we're going to see how some of that kind of where we see it, where some of the, what, like, we're not going to see how exactly the rapture came into existence as a thing or as a teaching, but the next section will sort of show kind of how you can start to see where some of these ideas are, are coming from, um, especially like we talked about the Jerusalem, the hovering Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven and hovers over earthly Jerusalem when you got two and... Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get into that tonight a little bit. But um, very I mean, easy stuff, right? So um, the recap of verses 1 through, what, 6? 1 through 7, whatever it was. 1 through 6. So basically um, what John sees is um, um, among all the evil and destruction in the world, John sees Christ's death, resurrection, ascension. He sees that Satan has been bound in Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. Um, and so the, the, Satan has no power over the church or the proclamation of the gospel. Um, he is bound in that sense. Uh, and those who believed were raised from spiritual death in faith and await the resurrection on the last day. So he sees the church being preserved over this time. Christ is one. He has bound Satan. Satan is isn't allowed to do his worst anymore. Remember, he's kicked kicked out of um, having access any access to God. He cannot accuse us before the face of God anymore. Um, he is uh, his. He, and I think what we we ended on was this idea that um, previously. So we have the cross, right? So we have everything before the cross and everything after. So here is also the binding of Satan. So what that means is that before this, what Satan is able to do is to say, aha, there is no Messiah. You just have a promise. I mean, and, and that, that is easily, you know, for, for us, can lead us into despair. Because, I mean, he's right. I mean, there was a Messiah, obviously. <laughs> Jesus is eternal. But for our understanding, we could always look and say, the people back there could say, yes, God has not physically sent us the Messiah yet. So all we have is his promise, his word which is coincidentally what we have now. So, um, but now here that Satan is bound, Satan, he can lie about it, but we actually have the reality that Christ has actually come. We don't, have just, we don't just hold on to the promise that God gives. We hold on to the promise that God has fulfilled. And that's what changes the whole binding um, dynamic there, that Satan cannot erase this. So Satan is bound in that he cannot, he cannot undo that. Um, you know, and before this, he was, he was certainly trying to keep it from happening. I mean, he was doing his darndest. Um, but with this, I mean, it, it's, it's essentially game over at that point. Um, 
he, he thought, and of course, you know, God, of course, was in control of all things. Satan never had a chance. But if we're looking from Satan's point of view, before this, he had a fighting chance. He could try stuff. And I mean, he was even, what, what did he do? Tempted Jesus. Tried to get Jesus to abandon his ministry. Um, after this, he can't. He's done. <laughs> um, all he can do here is thrash, and basically it's collateral damage now. What he does is to inflict as much pain and suffering on us, to drag as much of us with him as he's in his, you know, he's bound and he's heading out. So that is his goal currently. Sound good? Well, I mean, it doesn't sound good. But <laughs> Well, no, he's not scary illusions. Um, see, and that's, that's kind of the, 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 the struggle we have with dealing with Satan is that there's, I always look at it like, here, here's, <laughs> here's Lutherans. <laughs> here's where we're supposed to be, nice, nice in the middle, right? Um, the way we view Satan is he is absolutely real. He has the ability to deceive us, to tempt us, to, um, uh, to drive a wedge between us and God, to use our sinful flesh against us. He can do a lot of stuff. But in so doing, we also realize, though, that he cannot, God is, I mean, he's not more powerful than God. Um, not even a chance. So as, as much as we're afflicted, all we have to say is, you know, I'm a baptized child of God, saying you have no power over me. You, you can, the worst you can do is to bring my death and deliver me into the waiting arms of my Savior. That is, that is the, so we, we have this, this very healthy balance of fear, well, not really, but I mean being aware of Satan and wary of him, let's say wary of him, but not afraid of him. The pendulum then swings in two different directions where um, we go to um, denial. There is no Satan. Or Satan is completely dealt with, so he has no power whatsoever. So you don't have to be afraid of him or wary of him at all. He's not even an issue. Or <laughs> um, hyper aware. <laughs> or Satan is everywhere and he's he's creeping in everything, and you have to really be on your toes all the time, every second, and if you just slip once, he's gotcha. That's the hyper-aware, like, okay, I'm so concerned about Satan that I'm going to live in fear. People working in another church have used scripture to say to me that Satan is in control of our lives right now. Right, oh, okay. The, the, the comment for those online is uh, people have said, or you tried to tell her that um, Satan is in control of your life right now. I was actually in, in high school, um, I attended a, I, I, I visited a youth group. It was my brother-in-law's family, or his church's youth group. I, I visited it once, and it freaked me out, and I never went back. Um, because they were, they were very much of the, kind of like that, like Satan is the prince of this world. He runs the show. He is, he has domain over everything. And so you have to... You know, be super Christian. You have to be, you know, on the lookout for every little detail. Um, and it's like, does Scripture talk about Satan being the prince of of the world? It's like, well, in in some sense, yes. He he has he has a lot of <laughs> he he does affect a lot. He is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So yeah, absolutely, he's around. But um, well, okay. So if the idea is he is the prince of this world, okay, sure. But this is where they stay. So he's in charge. We might say, yeah, he's the prince of this world. He is the king of kings. <laughs> he is God almighty. Satan <laughs> is under his foot. You know, and that was the promise of Genesis, that you're, you're, he will strike your heel, but you will bruise his head. So, um, so if you can imagine before, you know, Satan is, you know, he's a snake prowling around, right? Uh, here, no snake. <laughs> here, snake prowling around, and here's Jesus' foot. One, two, three, four, five, yes. There we go. Boom. Here's blood, blah. All right. 
So you, you, you see the, 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 the extremes there and then the rational. <laughs> the, 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 like, this is the Lutheran yes and no. Do you need to be wary of him? Yes. Do you need to be deathly afraid of him? No. Uh, oh, we have a comment. Um, how can Satan be in charge if he's bound is the comment. Good question. He's not in charge. Um, being bound, he is limited um, greatly by what he can do. So, um, but the idea is that God has allowed him. I mean, if God so wanted Satan to be completely done away with in the current time, he would be. But for whatever reason, and, and we're going to talk about a little bit how we're going to talk about how Satan is released for a little while. <laughs> um, why does God do that? God does what he does. Um, it is all for some reason that we don't necessarily have all the answers to. Um, but Satan is bound in, in so to, really, I mean, really, it gives us a, a great deal of comfort because while he is still able to do things and afflict us, we have this. So the binding, this is, you know, this is the binding of Satan. So we don't have to be deathly afraid. We don't have to worry. Um, we, you know, we don't have to, you know, before, I can, I can imagine the people of God you know, they've done their sacrifices at the temple, whatever. Well, well wondering, like, am I still good? I mean, I, 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 I got to do more sacrifices. I got to do more sacrifices. It was, it was always looking ahead, looking ahead. Now, of course, behind the sacrifice was always the promise. The sacrifices were supposed to direct them to Jesus. But if you get caught up in that, you're just thinking like, okay, well, uh-oh, Satan's attacking me. I must, I need to do more. I need to do more. And he's, he's getting you all off on the wrong track. Now, it's like, okay, the sacrifice is done. I don't have to worry. So when I'm afflicted by Satan, I don't have to sit here and when he says, oh, you need to be better, you need to do more, it's all on you, I say, shut up. Jesus crushed your head. Ah, go away. Um, and, he, and he'll say like, okay, well, I'll go away, but I'm going to leave you with this and zap. Um, and we say, Psh. okay, I mean, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> like, I'm not happy about it. But you know what? I'll live, <laughs> and then I'll die, and then I'll live again. <laughs> so, there we go. All right. So let's go on to the next part. <laughs> we'll get through another three verses tonight. <laughs> the next part should be a lot quicker. And then the, the second part even, even more so. Can I throw in you can throw in, sure. Yes. Yes. Because everyone in Muslim countries at that time was calling the United States the great Satan. Right, right, right. So it should have been titled American Satan. <laughs> okay. Okay. I had to write about this. I wanted to write about this. <clears throat> reference there. My mother, who's not very educated, saw that book on my shelf and started telling everyone in her family that I was worshiping. Ah, okay. So many things have gone out against me since the 90s that nobody should pay any attention to because it, uh, I never, I, you know, I've encouraged people who gave up the worship of Satan to serve God with both hands. Okay. Yeah, I love those people. So if you hear anything like that, just, <laughs> just laugh. I'll, I'll, we'll just say she, she has a weird library. She, you know, some people... Right. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you hear about Marilyn being a Satanist, do not believe it. <laughs> right. I have never and never will worship Satan, even though I did write about Satan. Uh, hey, I, if you look through my music catalog, you would highly <laughs> suspect some things about me. So. I, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on to verses 7 through 10. All right, and when the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, 
So, we've got at the end of, so, now it's at, at, the thousand years are ended, so we are now talking, now, this is one of the few places where we know for sure that we're talking about a time or a certain chronology. So the last day, the thousand years, the millennium is over, the fullness, so in the fullness of time, on the last day, um, Satan will be released from his prison, come out to deceive the nations, um, Gog and Magog, okay, yada, 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 gather for battle. So now we get some interesting stuff here. Now we've seen, uh, and now remember, Revelation does not go like straight line, like this, then this, then this, then this. It doesn't go like, you know, you, you go, all right, step, you go like this, until you get real dizzy, <laughs> and then finally you're done. <laughs> so we've seen shades of this already, a final battle, a last ditch thing, um, the armies gathered at the Euphrates, Armageddon. So we've already seen this. We've already been around this thing. So there, there's, there's an element of this where it's like, okay, we're just re rehashing what we've already seen, which Revelation, that's basically all the first 20 chapters have been so far, is rehashing things over and over again. Um, this is also one of the things where I'm going to say that you could take this literally in a way or more symbolically, okay? I, I find it fits more symbolically just because of the whole way that we've been um, going through Revelation and just, it's, it would be really weird if everything so far is symbolic and all of a sudden there's like this one, oh, but this is, <laughs> it's hard to argue that. But there, there are some teachings which say that, you know what, because it says Satan will be released for a little while, okay? So Satan is released, you know, after the thousand years, okay? Now the big question, and we, we touched on this a little bit last week, the big question that comes from that is why? Why would Satan be, so if this is literal and he is released to gather some kind of an army to make some kind of last ditch assault on the church because they, they surrounded the city, so we're talking about Holy Jerusalem, Zion, the people of God, the church. So, and, and it's, you know, if you take it too literally, then you're like, okay, so all the earth, you know, all of Satan's armies covering the earth descend on, you know, this one little plot of land in the Middle East. Like, well, that's probably not the case. So we're going symbolic there too. Um, so why would he do that? Why would Satan be released? We don't have an answer to that. And earlier in chapter 28, it says he'll be released for a little while. John never gets an answer to it. God does not reveal to him why. Not once does it ever say why. And unfortunately, when we are left with an unanswered why, it gives people just the crazy idea to go wild with it. So they come up with all sorts of ideas. Um, probably the most likely, if you want to go down this road and understand this, that Satan is released for this last ditch effort, um, the idea is, and, and he's to, to deceive the nation, so he's basically restrained. Or, uh, I'm not restrained, he's not restrained. He, the restraints are let loose. In fact, Satan is kind of, he's on the leash for the millennium, and then all of a sudden God says, all right, time's up, go for it! <laughs> like, really God? <laughs> um, so why would he do that? Well, what we, what, if you took it that way, this is not terribly unlike what we actually see in the book of Job. You know, God has, you know, he, he has provided for Job and all this, and, and he's, he's so proud of Job. Then Satan comes and says, oh, he only loves you because you give him stuff. So what does God say? He says, okay, all bets are off. Do what you want. So he basically takes Satan off the leash for Job with the caveat that you can't kill him. Um, so it's not, if, if you see it in, in that light, you can say, okay, well, maybe this releasing of Satan to assault the church one last time, kind of taking the reins off and saying, go to town, um, could be the purpose to prove Satan wrong before the whole world. So basically, because you have, you know, all the forces of Satan going full bore against the church, you know, and saying, like, attack, all right? 
and they start and they they're doing their worst. Well, this is all the last day, so the return of Christ is imminent. So when when God then says, "Okay, enough. It is over." The church remains. God has preserved his church. So it's kind of like, well, maybe that's Satan being allowed to do this in order for God to prove a point to Satan. I'm not so sure about that because it just doesn't, eh, it doesn't jive with me. It makes sense that Satan and his minions would say, hey, you've locked us up. We've rehabilitated. We're different. We've paid for our sins. You should give us the same salvation Um, you gave to everybody else. And he lets them go to show nothing's changed. They're as evil and wicked and horrible so that he can be clear (sighs) when he judges them so that they have no excuse. Their destiny is sealed. Uh, I mean, it's... It, it's possible. I mean, there's a lot of roads. I mean, you could take that and and go. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. Of, here's the problem: <laughs> is this we don't have, because it's like, well, why? And and so we can't go a lot of places. I mean, that sounds reasonable. It's possible. It's possible. It's sure. Not necessarily the explanation. It just comes to mind. Right. Um. And 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 seeing and what where I go obviously is more symbolic with this. So um, symbolically then. <laughs> Um, the releasing of Satan from the abyss. So God says, okay, I'm going to have to release you for a little while. Well, you know, we're talking about a millennium, thousand years, and now a little while. So how long is that? Well, my assumption is like little while, boom. And why would, so, and in the whole context of what we're reading here, remember Satan is in the, the abyss, right? Here's where Satan is bound, if we recall that. What happens here is he's taken out of that and then thrown into what? The lake of fire. Eternal fire. Yeah. This is like, this is judgment day. So, for Satan to come from the abyss to the lake of fire, what has to happen? He has to come out. Can he come out by himself? No. No, why? Because who holds the key? Jesus. So in my assessment of this, and what I think is a more sensible way of understanding this, is God says, okay, I'm going to release Satan. And so what does Satan see? He says, oh, I'm being released. Oh, come on, guys, let's get him. <laughs> and in that same moment, it's like, oh, no, oh, no. And God throws him into the lake of fire. <laughs> um, because... What happens is, so Satan is, is released from prison. They march, they surround, but then what happens immediately? Fire comes down. There, I mean, immediately stuff happens. So this doesn't seem to indicate that there's, you know, he, he's released to deceive the nations. Well, um, he's already done, done that, right. but you could even look at this by saying, okay, so the nations, typically, when we're talking about the nations in, in um, Scripture, they're usually all those other people. You know, you got the believers and then you got the nations. So if Satan is being released, his release deceives the nations because they think, oh, see? We told you that God was silly, that that Jesus guy was full of beans. Um, full of beans, wow. Um, wow. That's an old-fashioned thing to say. Um, <laughs> You're old. <laughs> I'm not sure where that came from. Um, that was, you know what? That was my internal filter. Protecting myself from saying something a lot worse. <laughs> we got it. So if you ever hear me, you know, say, oh, calm, sarn it. Um, <laughs> that means I was thinking something way worse with a lot of four letters. Um, and and thankfully, my filter was like, no, you're in church and you're a pastor. Um, don't <laughs> say that. Uh, oh, I, I, I freaked out. I, I worried uh, a week or two ago when I said scared the bejesus out. Oh, it was the Jaws thing. Yeah. I said how the sharks scared the bejesus out of me. And I said that. I'm like, oop. From the church. From and I had to think. I'm like, was that wrong? Like, is that a? No. 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 <laughs> I, got, filters. I got another story about that, but we'll, we'll save that for later. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is really more. And Gog and Magog, the thing about that is the meaning of those names, nobody knows. Not exactly. Uh, they are referenced a few times in the Old Testament, but... Um, what, what they generally become known to be references to are 
enemies of God, ancient enemies of God. So the people of the people of the world who reject God. Um, so you could develop a whole theology around why this happens and all that, or you could look at what happens here in these three verses to say that in the fullness of time, God takes Satan out of the abyss and chucks him into the lake of fire, and he is judged and gone, which, if you're looking for a book of comfort, that tracks a lot better than, hey, I know we've been promising you comfort all the time, but if you're so lucky as to be here on the last day, <laughs> sorry, it's going to get really bad, um, but don't worry because, you know, God's proven a point, it's like, I don't know, that just feels to me. But it's not about feelings, but I still think this is more accurate. So if you want to go somewhere else with it, by all means, you may go somewhere else with it, but um, this seems a lot more reasonable. Um, and even in the sense of looking at how God deals with things, is it, you know, when we, if we were to see God unlock the abyss and Satan comes out, I mean, our initial thing would be fear. I mean, if we, if we were alive on when that happened and we saw that, I mean, we'd be terrified. Um, so, so to say that, okay, th heads up, this is going to happen and it's going to look like Satan is getting ready for an attack, but God's going to rain down fire and judge him. So eh, that sounds better. <laughs> I like that better. Um, any comments, thoughts about that? Look online. Pause for anybody to get more brownie. <laughs> Here, hey, hey, Christine, put the brownie picture up again. There, look, look at that. There, oh, there we go, people. Oh, oh, people at home, look what you're missing. Oh, yes, the, the brownie goodness of Christine. Some more brownie. All right, we're right, right back. <laughs> <laughs> See, just think if if all you people online who live far away moved to Mi Michigan, you could you could take part in the brownies. Ah, <laughs> the comment torture. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, it's the, the beauty of the brownie and the, 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 the wonderful deliciousness of God's salvation. See, it's all, it's all yeah, works together. Yeah, show up next time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's move on then to verses 11 through 15, and that should take care of us tonight, and that'll actually... We went about half hour over last time, so we might end, you know, 15 minutes early this time. All right. Oh, okay, right. Hold on, Christine. Go. Okay. So the, the comment before that was that the beast and the uh, false prophet were already there. Um, so, yeah, it, again, the timeline gets... If, if you're looking for when it happens, it's like... Uh, um, other than to say that... Well, and, and actually... So the beast and the, the false prophet are already in the lake of fire when Satan gets thrown in there. You know, I would say that that would actually lend more weight to the symbolic idea... Because when Satan is released, somehow at some, at some point, the, his two best weapons have already been taken away from him. So the, the beast and the false prophet are already condemned and sent away. Um, however that happens, whenever, maybe that's like right before he unlocks, whatever. But um, that would seem to indicate that G Satan doesn't even have the power to deceive anybody. So he really has nothing. I like that. Good, good catch. All right, cool. All right, verses 11 through 15. All right, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Guess who? From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All right, so second death, lake of fire, hell. Okay, so we've got a great 
Don't look like a chair. Uh, got a nice armrest. Uh, okay, and big old cushion. We gotta have. See, I can draw decent chairs. Yeah, just good. you know, frogs and lambs and <laughs> anything else. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> With a life history of Sean, his daughter Lily. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> so, a great white throne. So, heaven and earth, you know, everything melts away. So, we are definitely this is judgment. Judgment day. Terminator 2. All right. Uh, Jesus, oh, okay. Oof. <laughs> okay, imagine Jesus is sitting on the throne. There you go. Good solution. Yes. You know what? I'm drawing it anyway. So. It's the smiley face. There you go. With a beard. Oh, well, he's got to have a beard. He's Jesus. Long hair. Oh, yeah, not he's got. Not necessarily. Jesus was a hippie. Yeah, we all know this. Accepted. We've got. Um, he could have had a comb over. You know, we've got Caucasian know. Uh, know. Swedish Jesus on all the pictures. So there's his foot. There's his foot. Okay. Hey, look at me. And he's got apparently skeleton or scarecrow hands. I don't know why. I just decided to draw five wow. fingers. Okay. Here's, here's his crown. There we go. Don't take a picture. I can see. Where I, I, I didn't even need to look. We're imagining Jesus. Okay. All right, so before the throne, okay, so we saw the dead, right? Great and small, all the dead. All the dead. So here's all the dead. Now, it doesn't make distinction here. We're not talking about just, you know, unbelievers. This is all the dead. Everybody's dead. <laughs> well, now they're not. They're brought to life, okay? Um, and st standing before the throne... Books were opened. So we've got books. Lots of them, right? Uh, some of them have pictures. Some of them don't. Okay. Lots of books open. But then on the other side, or we've got what? We've got one book. Yes. The Book of Life. All right, so we've got books and book. Should be fairly obvious, but we're making the distinction because it, it matters. All right, death and Hades gave up the dead, yada, yada, yada. So, you know what, we're going to skip death and Hades being thrown into the lake of fire because that's awesome, but we're going to skip that for a second. Um, so each one of the dead then, what does it say? They were judged according to the, de the dead, the deed, the deed were judged. Uh, the dead were judged by what was written in the books. So these books are essentially, yeah, every person's catalog of every thought, word, and deed. Everything they've done, thought of, didn't do everything. This is the book of their life. Everything. So the dead are judged, and notice all dead. Dead are judged by what's in their books, okay? So if there's, so this guy, there's sin all over it. <laughs> well, there's sin all over all of them, right? But let's say theoretically there was just one spot of sin in one of those books, just one page, one little thing. Lake of fire. <laughs> fire. All right, sin. Sends you right there. Um, because they're ju judged according to their works. Their righteousness depends on their works. Your, well, not just their, your. In judgment, your righteousness depends on what's written in your book, right? Aha, uh -huh, except. There is a little, little asterisk here. But if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the fire. So, You've got all these books. Well, if, if you're, so we've got Lee, we've got Mary, we've got Marilyn, we've got Kenda, we've got Nate, we've got the McCoys. <laughs> Not writing all your names. Um, 
Where's the teenager? Connie. Or the, the big teenager? Connie. She's Connie. okay. Oh, Connie gosh, Connie. Connie. <laughs> Connie and Jim. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Christina. I'm not trying to suggest <laughs> anything. Well, you guys weren't here last week. <laughs> I was watching. <laughs> Joanne. Okay, so we're all sinners. Our books are just filled with horrible, horrible things. And not so horrible things, but still sin. Are you claiming your own? Okay. <laughs> so, but, so he looks at these books, but then he look, references this one. And if he finds your name, here, we'll even circle you guys. He uses, uses the example. The book of life means that you are covered by the blood of Christ. So now, basically, the judgment does not depend on that. The judgment is, depends on that. So instead of, so he sees your book, or says your name in this book, and he says, oh, well then I only see Christ's blood. I see Christ's works. I see his righteousness. So anybody who is not in here goes, boop. Anybody who's here goes into New Heavens, New Earth. New Hampshire, New England. Or is that, no, that's Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah. Ugh. New Hampshire, Nebraska. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Apologies to anybody who is watching from Nebraska. Um, we've been there. It's, uh, it's corn. Yeah, it's a lot of corn. You know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like a ha-ha, a lot of corn in Nebraska. But there is. It's really all there is. Um, it's like driving through Kansas and like it's flat. It is so flat in Kansas. Oh, brutal. Flat, flatter. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> So this is, this is the good thing, and this is, um, you know, this is the great lesson that we get all the time about our, our righteousness, that it is Christ's righteousness that saves us. Um, and, you know, I've, I've said you can picture this in a lot of different ways. You can, and this is the picture that Revelation gives us, that we have our books, but it only matters if we're found in here. You could say that he opens every book, every book, and so if, if, if you are not a believer, all he sees is sin. Or if he opens your book, all he sees, all that's written in there is no longer your stuff. You know, every page is dripping red, right? So all he sees is the blood. So either you want to say that, that he sees different things in here, whatever, whatever works for you. At the end of the day, what we're getting at is you're covered by the blood of Christ, makes you righteous, saves you. That is your salvation. Um, so that's, that's, that's everything going on there. The cool thing... Um, the really cool thing is that, you know, death and Hades gave up the dead, yada, yada, yada. But then, um, so the people who are not written in the book of life get thrown in there. But then death and Hades itself are thrown into the lake of fire. Um, oh, comments here. What if you happen to actually be alive on the last day? Um, well, then, then you just go right into her. You just wait in line. <laughs> you, you might be first in line. Maybe, maybe that's, I, I don't know. Um, we don't know if, so on the last day, does everybody like living, are they killed? Like, does everybody die? And then they're raised back to life? It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's possible that kind of, and what we've seen in Revelation so far is a lot of death, destruction, and especially the last chapter or two seems to indicate that at the end there is some kind of like, you know, fire coming down, destroying everything. So maybe part of this God judging Satan, you know, the fire that comes down, maybe that consumes everything. And that is the, 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 the destruction of the earth. You know, that is where everything is wiped out. So, and God says, okay, what is left? But now to sort the sheep from the goats. Um, and so we do that. And then next week we'll get into the new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem and all that. So um, we could be, so if, if, say if, you know, God comes back in, or Jesus comes back in two minutes, and we're, well, God willing, nobody dies in the next two minutes from natural causes, um, or unnatural causes, either way, but uh, assuming we're still alive, you know, maybe, maybe everything goes boom and we die. The good news is that you'll be brought right back, <laughs> so, yeah. um, or you just, or it's just boom, all of a sudden, you're, before the throne of God, nothing happened, and now you're just raised, and you go off, and you're good to go. 
Um, so unfortunately, we don't know exactly what happens with that, but that's... Oh, yes, yes. That uh, question is, that includes the people who have uh, been in heaven. So yeah, so the dead giving up its dead means so like all those who are dead are raised. So then basically you've got what happens is... Um, so when you die, you're either waiting in essentially hell or you're waiting in heaven, right? Your, your body and soul split. It's severed. And so you're, you know, your body lays in the ground. Your soul either goes there or there depending on whether you believe, had faith or not. Um, so then on this last day, yeah, er everybody's brought to life. So those in heaven are reunited with their bodies. Or given new bodies. Um, and same here, they're given their bodies back, um, and then it's off. So the cool thing is that death and Hades are themselves, you know, hell is thrown into hell, <laughs> which is a crazy idea. Uh, death is thrown into hell. So, um, I mean, really putting the, the fine point on it, that w when you're in here, death is done away with, you know, they suffer forever. Death suffers forever. Your pain and anguish, your, your, all the aches and pains of life, all the sorrow, all the everything, all the death suffers eternally, is cast away, never to be seen again. Um, death and Hades. Hades. So even Hades is, you know, the, the concept of a, a condemnation no longer exists for you because things are made new and right all right, we have a comment here. I believe any who are alive will simply be changed into glorified bodies, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, yeah, very... I mean, the, the, with that, as I like so, is that just the believers get glorified bodies and non-believers get old junkers? Um, or do they get... It, it's, I'm not sure. But um, it could be either way. Um, it's one of those where it's, like we, it, it's fun to kind of talk about sort of like... A, you know, a favorite son or Bible study question is always like, what's heaven going to be like? Like, we can, we can speculate a lot. We can talk about it. Um, at the end of the day, we don't really know how it's going to work exactly other than it's going to be a really awesome, perfect waiting place until we get to here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we might all of a sudden just have glorified bodies. If that's the case, sweet. Um, but I guarantee if you're still alive on that list day, yeah. You're not going to be so concerned about what, how it happens. <laughs> You're just going to be like, hey, cool. Made it. <laughs> um, so, so Jacob has a good point, and it very well could be. All right. And that's it for that chapter. Something really extraordinary is happening out there. The sun is shining, and it's pouring down rain. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we drove up, and it was uh, you know, kind of cloudy but clear for the most part, blue sky, and then just torrential downpour right over us. I, it was torrential, and now it's kind of yeah. a little bit. We got some so, weird, the sun is shining right through weird it. weather so going on. There's probably a great rainbow yeah. out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. What was that? Uh-oh. It I followed said, my car all the way over the Oh, country. it followed you. <laughs> yeah, nice. it wasn't raining until she pulled in. Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. Go to California. It's, it's Joan's fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Colorado. Through Colorado. They need rain. All right. Any questions about any of this? <laughs> well, no. Questions about <laughs> this. Not, Not the rain, oh, kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. It's really cool. It, it is, is weird. weird. <laughs> it's natural. Happens oh. all the time. Well, no, I mean, we'll go right kind of first, then. <laughs> oh, fun! We believe that. Question: We believe that cremation is okay. Yes. The uh, so the 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 question is cremation, and I get this question a lot. Um, you know, burial versus creation, cremation. Um, the, I mean, the, the, the whole concept behind it is more, what does this, what does this preach? And that's really what, what I tell people when I counsel them with their choice.
Because, I mean, if, if you go for like a, looking for a nuts and bolts kind of answer and you say, well, you can't be cremated because, um, <laughs> oh, I see. Jacob just stood waiting at Meyer for 10 minutes for the rain to stop. <laughs> and there is a rainbow, he says. So there we go. Um, you know, if we're saying that God, you know, can't somehow put together ashes or reconstitute us. Well, yeah. I mean, it would, it would mean that, that anybody who is killed in some explosion or burned, you know, martyrs burned alive or whatever. So what happens to them? So it's, it's not so much, um, for, for us, it's not so much like, well, can God do this? Can, it's like God, can, God can raise anything. I mean, good Lord, if you were you know, at the center of a you know, bomb going off, there wouldn't even be ashes. Um, you'd just be vaporized. So it's more of when you get down to it, what is it going to confess? And so, yeah, a, a burial is certainly, the confession it makes is this body, as it is, is going to the ground, and this body will be raised again. I mean, there is a, there is a lot of good comfort in that, saying like this, as, as we lay this body to the, in, to the dirt, this body will rise again, God will preserve it. Does that mean that doesn't happen with cremation? Well, no, absolutely. It's just what I tell people is it's a personal choice. And honestly, I would say the decision has to do more with the people who are left behind, your, your family and loved ones particularly. What is it going to preach to them? Okay. So um, you know, for me, I used to be very pro, I'm going to be cremated. Then I was like, no, I want to, I want to be buried. And now I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Some days I'm just like, so, anyway. most, most days I'm just like, bring it, <laughs> end it now. Um, <laughs> I can't handle this world anymore. Um, but like I, I, open casket versus closed casket. So you decide I want to be buried. Well, open or closed. Does it matter? Yeah, exactly. Um, Heather does... I don't think she wants me to be buried. Um, she definitely, if, if, if I am, she definitely doesn't want an open casket. Um, and that, that's the thing. If, if, if the family is going to be more aggrieved by an open casket, guess what? Close it. If they're going to be more aggrieved by having a body. I mean, see, and especially if, if, the, if the whole family comes to church. Now, and every family is different. So you say a family who grew up in this church the patriarch, matriarch, whoever dies. We have a funeral, okay? Well, that family's still coming to church, right? Still coming to church. Well, for a while, it's going to be hard for them, right? Coming to the place where they saw their loved one. So maybe for them, it's better to see the casket with the body up there because they know, you know, in, in context of, of the altar and everything, okay, great. Maybe it's too painful for them, and they know it'll be harder for them to be in church from now on at that church seeing the body. So maybe they want an urn. Okay, um, I can, you know, and I've, I've worked with people and I, I, I tell families, you know, because they often ask, like, they're not sure what to do, open, close. And they think, well, open is nice because, you know, you can still see, you know, people can see them and then last goodbyes if they don't have a viewing. Um, the one thing that nobody ever thinks about is you're going to have to close that casket. Now, the plus is closure. The minus is Closure. How is it going to hit you? Um, my buddy in Saginaw, um, who, who's pastor there, when their, I think Daniel was eight years old when he died, their son. We were living in Oklahoma at the time. I came up for the funeral. Um, I was with them in the back right before the service, and we closed it. It was the most heart-wrenching thing I've ever experienced in my life. I've never cried so bitterly and painfully. Um, so I can't even imagine. And so there's that. Um, so, some people, I mean, they need that closure. And that actually is good for them. And it's like, you know what? Okay, fine. Guess what? Going to do a, are you going to do a graveside? That adds another level to it. Because you can be fine with everything, even closing that casket. Because you know what? You close the casket, you bring the casket up to the front body's still there. Guess what happens to the graveside? Goes into a hole. 
if you can see, I'm getting, my hair is all, yeah, every time I do a graveside, I'm overwhelmed when they lower the body. And thankfully, sometimes, most of the ones I've been to, they don't immediately start to cover. I've been at one, at least, where they started to cover. Oh, my. I cannot tell you how heartbreaking that was. And I mean, it's not, I mean, some of them weren't even part of my congregation. Some of these were for other people. But my heart breaking for the family who, I mean, in that moment realizing, now granted, yes, this, you're going to see them again. You'll be in heaven, you know, you'll be in new heaven, new earth with them. You'll see them again. This is the rock solid promise. You're not saying goodbye. But for the rest of your life here until you die. That is huge. And that is, put. I mean, no pun intended, final nail in the coffin, right? Um, that is the closure. That is, unless we go and dig him up, we're never seeing him in this life again. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, so when it comes to issues of that, you know, it's like, what are we working with? You know? And I'm more concerned about the family. I mean, friends, eh, whatever. But, I mean, the, the, the family. What do they need? If they need casket, beautiful. If they need cremation, okay. If they need open casket, all right. Um, my job is just to prepare them for it. But, um, you know, these are things that you don't always necessarily think about. Kind of like, you know, planning a wedding outside. You don't think about bathrooms. And it's like, oh, yeah, we need bathrooms. Um, I mean, it, it, it sounds silly, but, I mean, I, I tell people about this, like, okay, if you're going to do this, just know that when you close it, it's going to hit like a Mack truck, and they're like, <gasps> and that realization comes. Because, I mean, you're not, you're not thinking about that. Um, so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, if you want to be cremated, be cremated. God will mix you in a solution and bake you, and you'll be fine. Um, <laughs> if you want to be buried, you know, he'll get, get the modeling clay, <laughs> squish you back together, you're good. Um, However he does it, you'll be fine. So, yeah, it's just, and, and you know, it, well, is it a cost issue? Well, then fine. I mean, is it going to break the family to, to bury you? Okay. Is it cheaper to go cremation? Um, but like I said, a, a burial does preach something. But if you have a decent enough pastor, the ceremony, the, the service should preach <laughs> plenty. Um, so, you know, the, the <laughs> my problem with the idea of what does it preach is that a casket, an urn, whatever, it does preach. It preaches the law. You're, you're going to die. You're all going to die. This is all going to be you someday. Um, so, yeah, it does preach. <laughs> so we, if you're just going to put a body in a casket and dump them off, yeah, that preaches a lot. It's nothing good. If you're going to put a body in however what, an urn or a casket in a service and have a, a divine worship service, a, a funeral service that proclaims Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of their sins and by the grace of God, they are living uh, right now in heaven praising God and you will see them again. Well, then that's the gospel. And that's the answer to what the urn, the casket preaches. So there you go. That's my, that's my, uh, my spiel on that one. I give it a lot, so a lot of spieling. All right. Oh, yeah, Mary, you had a question. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I gotta remember. Like, I should when I start to see myself going off, I should like wait. Let me write it down. Oh, we got it. Right. Yes. So we're talking about judgment. Oh, okay. I see where you're going with that. So there, there seems to be like a pre-judgment going on. Okay. So Mary's question is, so is there kind of a, a preliminary judgment when you die before the last day? If you die, your soul goes to heaven. If you're a believer, it waits in hell if you're not. It's not linear, but 
when it comes down to it, even, even on the last day, when we are being judged according to, if we're in the book of life, the judgment has already occurred on the cross. So absolutely. So, and, and even, and not just on the cross, well, on the cross, but I mean for everyone. So like Moses, I mean, Moses is in heaven. We know this because he comes back and chats with Jesus. Um, Moses was prejudged according to the cross. Now the cross hadn't technically come yet, but he was, he held to the promise, the, the faith in that. So he was, on the cross, he, he was judged. I mean, his faith judged him, essentially, before that. Um, so when we die and we go to heaven, we're, the preliminary judgment is, I mean, we've been judged on the cross. So if anything, when we come before the throne, it's like it's already been, the paperwork's already been filed. <laughs> There's no more, everything's been submitted, the bureaucracy has done its work, so Jesus is there with his stamp saying, boom, saved. Um, or sheep, 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 and then these guys are like goats, 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 goats. Um, so yeah, but yeah, good, good uh, catch there. Oh, let's see. Just imagine what it will be like for people who are in or near a cemetery on Resurrection Day. <laughs> <laughs> Zombies. Good point, Jacob. <laughs> Zombies. Bring a shovel. It'll be there. awesome. <laughs> Walking to thriller. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, no thriller video. <laughs> well, I guess technically Michael Jackson. Will, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> we don't need to go down that road. All right, any other questions, comments? Well, actually, and kind of on time. Cool. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for everybody jumping online. Um, take home a piece of chunk of brownie with you. Sorry. Um, so yeah, thank you. And we'll continue. So we'll pick up on chapter 21 next week and uh, things should pick up and we should move along at a quicker clip these last remaining chapters. So thank you very much.